Women to Watch is an intimate look into the lives of prominent and influential women leaders from around the world and the challenges they faced on their journey. It's the real story behind her title. Join us every week to hear more stories about women from around the world and in your own communities at womentowatch.net. Do you stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. For the big story on Action News. Search 6ABC <laughs> Philadelphia and start streaming today. excited uh, for my interview today. Joining me in just a moment will be Stacy Ike. Stacy is an entrepreneur. She is a TV and uh, podcast host, currently the host of Human to Human. Um, and she's a producer. And she's been very successful in the media um, and entertainment industry. As always, for all things Women to Watch, you can go to our website at womentowatch.net. And uh, also stay with us during the breaks where you will hear from our exclusive watch team of on-air contributors. And this week, you're going to see a great short segment for our Philly Watch segment with Ben and Jasmine, who's going to be, uh, they'll be chatting with um, award-winning chef and restauranteur Ellen Yin. So I'm excited to see that as well. So now I'm very honored and excited to welcome to the show, Stacy Ike. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. I'm, I'm so thrilled to have you. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for, I'm excited. Well, it's going to be a great conversation specifically because you're so um, relaxed and uh, you, I'll, you find joy, I'll say, in talking about kind of life and meaningful topics and um, humanity and it's all that stuff I love. So yeah. um, I'm happy to turn the tables on you. I <laughs> listen to quite a few of the podcasts. You ask incredibly good questions. Mm. Uh, so I feel a little pressure <laughs> um, to, to measure up. But um, the first thing I wanted to ask you was you, you really are genuinely at ease in conversation, you know, and that really disarms people that are that are around you in front of you. And I wonder, were you always like that, even when you were young? Um, wow, thank you for saying that. I want to say yes, I was. I think we'd have to ask my close circle and say, you know, would they say that? But I have always genuinely enjoyed being curious about people. And so I probably, that natural desire plus the like, learning of, you know, humanity and myself and just people around me and recognizing what does make people feel comfortable? How, how are, you know, studying language and really studying journalism and then studying people? I feel like that contribution or excuse me, that combination kind of turned me into the person I am today. But yeah, as a young person, like I can still remember being 15 and just being like, oh, okay, yeah, this is the type of person I want to be. Because I remember when people would share with me and I would say, oh, I like that. I like that they trusted me. Do I, how, what does it take to be trustworthy? Okay. You got to keep their secret. Like I would really think about that as a young person. So yeah, that's, that is, yeah, I guess <laughs> I, I, I think about uh, being, when I say young, I think about high school on, cause in middle school, I think I like loved being popular and cool, but I didn't use it wisely or care about what it meant. And then as soon as I got to high school, I was like, I think it means something different and I'm going to figure out what that looks like. And so that was the journey that I started. Yeah. T can you tell me a little bit about your, um, tell me about the community you grew up in. I know that you were uh, born in Houston, Texas. Yes. What was that community like? Yeah. I mean, Houston is a really diverse place. Uh, it was, I come from a big family. I'm the oldest. I have four younger siblings. Um, and so I already had like a big community just within going home. It's like, you got all these people running around with all these different personalities. And I've, I've always been very big on community. So even in school, like I had a lot of friends and I tried to do all the organizations and things like that. And Houston was a place that I think lended to creativity and to like trying new things at that age. I did end up leaving um, in my adult years for a while, but as a kid, I felt pretty nurtured here and I felt pretty like 
excited about the new things I could learn and share because people were always doing different cool things that I was like, oh, I haven't thought about that. Okay. I haven't, you know, I'm not, I could just sing and be in choir and then I could be in journalism and I could, you know, do the news on school. And I'm like, okay, cool. So I, I, I am excited that I did go to a school that had some of those things and elements that I was attracted to. When you think back um, to your little self, what was challenging for you? What, what, what's the first thing that comes to mind for what was the most challenging growing up those early years? Mm. I think as a young person and specifically in my experience, I think you're trying to figure out or I was trying to figure out how to be, how to be seen and heard and still respect other people in that process of like not necessarily like putting all of my things I need on other people, but learning how to like collaborate with that, learning how to say like, okay, this is me. And then when people don't like kind of reject that, learning how to not internalize that. I think as a young person, you're constantly, as a binational um, American, that's something I also reckon with later in my life. I am Nigerian and American. And I think in school, I was busy trying to figure out like, oh, am I Nigerian at school or am I American at school? Am I both? Like you don't really think you're allowed to be both because some of your community doesn't know exactly how to contribute to you as both or look at you as both or respond to you as both. And so there was a bit of like protecting my parents and, and their experience. And then my parents were probably protecting us because they have their own experiences. So there was a bit of that going on. Um, Again, as the oldest, I felt a large amount of responsibility. And so I just really, what I was pretty, I was bad at making mistakes. I felt, I think I beat myself up a lot when I would make mistakes as a young person. And yeah, I definitely reckoned with that later in life of like, wow, you really did not give yourself grace and did not have a lot of practice in that. I practiced more perfectionism for a long time because you want to be good and you want to do what's right and you want to like be there for people and be there for yourself, but you don't really know what that means. And so there was a lot of perfectionism um, that I wrestled with. Now I recognize that. And the time, I think you were just like, I just want to be good. And I just want to be liked. And I just want to be loved, you know? Yeah. Who's the first person that comes to mind if I ask you who is someone who believed in you? Oh, I have to say my parents. I, I would I would let them take the cake on that because they were gracious enough to not reject the fact that I was so curious. I mean, I was the type of kid who was like, these are adults. And I think I want to like get to know what they're about. And it's like, yeah, you're a kid though. So stop asking us these intimate questions. <laughs> like, and I do. Think <laughs> you the room. Yeah. The room. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, go to the yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I, I do believe that there was some of that, but I also think that they were like, okay, let's get curious about why she's so curious because a pastor at my uh, church came to my mom and was like, your kid's really like good at asking questions. You should consider journalism. And I don't know if I had really put words to what I was doing at the time. Cause I was like 17 when he said that. And I remember ended up going to do a tour at university of Missouri for my first college. And that's why I ended up going there. And so I still think about how that pastor felt like, let me, you know, get in here and say something. And my parents, they could have been like, well, we kind of want her to do this other thing. Cause you know, I come from a home that was like, you know, is anybody going to be a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer? And I was like, probably not. <laughs> and even a little bit. I'm a no, crazy. If he, if he hadn't said that to your parents, do you, what, you know, what were you dreaming about becoming or was, were you searching because you, I was, you yeah, I was searching. I was, I was definitely dreaming about like, I was obsessed with like Marvin Zindler in Houston, Texas. He was like one of the main um, hosts. He's passed away now, but literally when he passed away, my family called me, he passed away like probably within the past two years because I've how much I watched him on the news. Like I watched Oprah with my mom at 4 PM. Like I did all the things. So I was, I was a big Larry King fan. Like I was, really into it, just not knowing that, cause I didn't have anyone around me necessarily doing it. I was just into these people doing it. And then it was like, oh, well, I'm going to add myself to that list. So I think there was all, it was already brewing. And I was looking for like, am I a journalist? Am I a host? Am I, I, I didn't know exactly. But I was like, I love, yeah. And so I think that moment definitely gave me an in to, to go to a university that had like, yeah, a, a breath of, of this, Thing I was already attached to and excited about. And then it was that to me, the best school to do it. And so I was like, okay, this is my, this is what I'm doing. And like, it was pretty, by junior year, it was like, okay, she's probably gonna do journalism. We just got to figure out what that means. Yeah. There's, and you're right. There's a lot of aspects to that. Yes. Well, how about writing? Do you enjoy writing? 
Yeah, see, exactly. So I did at that time, I still do, right? And I'm actually like reminding myself to get back into it because actually just yesterday I had a meeting with one of my, with one of my teammates and they were like, why aren't you blogging anymore? And I was like, why did you say that? And they're like, I just read your blog randomly and it's so good. And I was like, oh, wow. So I haven't written, I, I think the hosting and the on-camera stuff definitely took more press, more space and time after a while, but I do enjoy writing. I love writing. And so I am even reminding myself to intertwine that more and bring that back up. But yeah, it started with writing and then it moved to like, you know, presenting and then it get the question asking, like took the cake. I was like, oh my God, you just like ask people. Like it was, yeah, I was obsessed. It, I was obsessed. <laughs> for this? <laughs> oh my God. The what? amount of jokes my family makes. They were like, we used to make fun of you for talking so much and now you get paid to talk. This is, I'm like, yeah, everybody calm. Yeah, exactly. Don't make fun of kids. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. Okay. So you mentioned Oprah at the top yeah. of the show. And of course, I mean, that one word, you know, is just globally recognizable. And yeah. um, I, I think I wanted to ask you know, so you met her and she handpicked you to host a show on her network, which is mm -hmm. so exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, two questions I have, actually. When you first did, was did you feel intimidated at all meeting her? And what surprised you the most? Oh, that is such a good question. Um, so, yes, I, I don't know if it was intimidation or just like I had it in my mind, like, you either need to make Oprah laugh or smile. I mean, laugh or cry. Like that's the thing she knows how to do. So you got to figure out how to do it back to her. You and I and then her emotionally. Yeah, I was like, that you is. need to get to her emotionally, or you need to make her laugh. Like that's yeah. your two options. You can't just like ask her a good question. That's not enough. So I was preparing for that interview, pretty like nuanced in a way. Like I was just trying to find an angle to get to her because I knew so many people were going to be on that red carpet. And I also planned for her not to be there. So I kind of kept my like expectations low. Cause I was like, she might, she's not really going to show up. That would be crazy. Like she's really going to come to this huge red carpet with all these people. And then she totally did. And I think what surprised me most was how, how, what's the word, how just grounded she was while she was there. Like when I mean, she just walked and whisked and like talked to people and was cool. And that's kind of how we ended up reconnecting because she was at the after party of that event and was walking around. And I was like, I'm going to talk to her. <laughs> like, I'm not going to waste this moment, even though, yes, I'm a little nervous, but I'm going to, I mean, she's just walking around and being very comfortable. And I wanted to make sure I approached her with respect, but also like took the opportunity to just say hello. And so I had my moment with her on the red carpet and, um, and it was good. I made her laugh. And I was like, okay, you got the laugh. You, you're not going to get the cry. It's okay. It was multiple people trying to get to her. Not the so, place to cry. <laughs> exactly. I was like, this isn't, this is a happy event. This is great. So you're good. So, so I had that moment and it was lovely. And then I said, okay, yeah, you're never going to, you're probably never going to meet her again. That's, that's it. And then she was, like I said, walking around at the event. And so I took an opportunity just to come say hello and to make a joke about avocados because I found out she was obsessed and I'm obsessed. And so I was like, okay, let's talk about that. And she was like, nobody talks to me about it. I'm obs like, I'm obsessed. I have a garden. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> and so, <laughs> yeah. So then we took a picture and that was really fun. And then few months later, I saw her on another red carpet. And that's when she said, Oh, I just listened to your podcast. And like, you know, I was like, okay, wow. So I, again, even though I was a little nervous, I was like, fight the nerve and take this a step further. And I asked her when she was going to come on and she did. And that was, you know, she was, she came on for a podcast. I was working with another company and, um, that was amazing. And I think that is what made her think, Oh, let me look into this person a little more. And so yeah, that's such a great um, example of seizing an opportunity. Don't be afraid, you know, to walk up to that person. And yeah. you've interviewed a lot of notables, famous celebrity types. Yeah. Um, do you think that that experience has allowed you to become more relaxed when, you know, you look, talked about Oprah walking in and she really is so relaxed and grounded, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but she wasn't when she was younger. You know, she talks mm -hmm. about that. Oh. So yeah, how, where are you in that ability to really be centered mm. when you're around people that others get nervous about? Yeah, I think because my entry point and my highest interest is about people's humanity, I pretty early on took off the veil of like, yes, I know this person's big, but they're, they're a person under all the things. And mm -hmm. since you really care about figuring out 
who they are as a person, keep to that as your entry point. Like don't get overwhelmed by the other stuff. And like, I've, I've had to learn that obviously because yeah, the first few red carpets, you're like, whoa, this is a lot. But even then I, I felt like I was always comfortable. The, the nerves were, you don't want to mess up the moment. You really want to honor them. You want to like ask the great question. It's like more about the work than the person that I was more like, you know, shaken by, I wanted to do good work. And so that usually motivates me more than like, oh, this person's really big because I, I love, one thing I love is I love talking to people who like have done really big things and humanizing them. I really like when people can see a different lens of like how this person, you know, talks and thinks and feels about life. And I think it's so fascinating. And it's something I'm very fascinated by because to do, you know, really successful things, you know, it's a, it's a long journey, you know, you know, it takes different ups and downs. And so I'm always interested in what that looks like. What does that take? So mm -hmm. I do feel pretty relaxed. I do. I think I'm trying to think of who would currently like, like I would like to do Michelle Obama <laughs> and I feel like that would be like, okay, wow. You know, but also I've told myself like, no, there's, keep it, keep your same, same entry point because they're all people. Everyone is a person. Yeah. 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 Um, I was going to ask you that who is someone you haven't yeah. interviewed that you would like to. So you just answered that question. Yeah. Um, you mentioned, you, you use the word expectations and I listened to your um, interview with, um, Gretchen Rubin mm. and she's so cool and yeah. smart and wise. She seems like she's figured a lot of stuff out, you know? Yeah. Um, I also think I'm just like you kind of the questioner rebel slash. Yeah. yeah. Um, what did you learn about yourself and expectations from that interview? Oh my gosh. So the truth is I was, while interviewing her, like one th I went to therapy, um, I started therapy a couple years ago and that was a part of my like self-love journey and continuing to like grow as a person. And one thing I worked through a lot in therapy was about the expectations of life. I enjoy, like I, I have a big life and I also enjoy, and when I mean big, I really mean passionate. Like I feel very passionate about life. And I think with me, passion to me, sometimes it extends to a lot of expectations. And I always was trying to learn, like, how do you monitor your expectations of others, of yourself, of like, you know, your goals of these long lists that we make that are inevitably like way too long and not normal for humans to even try to do in one week or one day, you know, like things that we just do to ourselves that later you might find out are unfair, but even in the moment you're like, you're just trying to figure out. And I think her framework gave me so much peace of like the journey of figuring that out. Because the thing, again, like you just said, like figuring things out, even on top of that, we have an expectation. I need to figure it out by this time. I need to do it like this. I need to do it at this point, you know, mm -hmm. um, with these people, all of those things. And I was in a space of figuring out what, what are healthy expectations of life truly. And so I had came across her work a year before interviewing her. So it was just lovely to be able to tell her like for a year, I've been able to like, use your framework to to remind me and keep me calm and keep me reminded of like oh okay this this is a moment you're having really high expectations you're allowed to have it high expectations but what comes when you do that okay what comes when you say okay actually i can shift because this is like not an expectation that's in a realistic time frame like being okay with wanting to be a go-getter and wanting to do good good work and just you know reach your highest self in this lifetime while still being recognized that you are human. And that is the most important thing. And so in your humanity, figure out ways to, and have tools to say, Oh, this is just me being a questioner right now, or this is just me being this, or, you know, versus like the constant self judgment that we do as humans that can be very natural. But I have really, my intention of going to therapy was to truly reframe my level of self judgment and fear and shame. And just like, being afraid of my vulnerability. I wanted to live it out very confidently and know that that's a part of who I am. And I think that's what I enjoy deeply about her framework. It just gave you like, oh, this is a part of who I am. And instead of shunning it and being afraid of it, I can use it to get more excited about who I am and to, to reevaluate and to reimagine how I see expectations and how I even put expectations on myself. Yes. And just the knowledge, the, the knowing of it, yes. right? So, yes. which is what happens when, you know, we self-reflection leads to awareness, leads yes. to just a knowing, I think that helps us navigate life better. You know, you're, you're someone who, you know, your interest in humanity and, and who people are and the way they live 
you know, I love that. And, but you work in the entertainment industry, Mm -hmm. right? So I'm curious how you navigate kind of, there's a sense, and I don't think, I think I can say this. There's a, there's a shallowness there, mm-hmm, parts, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but you're someone looking for meaning. How mm-hmm. do you navigate that or balance that? I don't know how to quite how to ask the question, but mm. do your meaningful work in a space that is sometimes very shallow? Yeah, right? yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, I had to learn to build a relationship with the word no. There are things that I wanted to do or there were opportunities that I wanted that I had to be honest with myself, like it doesn't lend to your ethos. And so you have to say no. And that was really hard because even though I enjoy entertainment as a whole, there are only certain aspects that I really do feel I'm more connected to. And there's certain that I'm like, oh, I'm not the right host for that or I'm not I'm not the right person for that because it won't you know, it won't create a a space for depth and for relationship and for growth. And so that is challenging. Also, I had to be reckoned, like there are things that I have not gotten, opportunities I haven't gotten because I didn't show up as like the entertainment host who was going to do surface level stuff. Sometimes I was looking to do something else that maybe that wasn't aligned with the project. And so Mm -hmm. to build a relationship with no was the lesson and is constantly the lesson as I go through it because yeah, like I've navigated it, but a lot of it was by the things that I didn't do versus the things I did. Mm, that's so interesting. Um, listen, we're going to go into our first break. Sure. Um, stay with us for our watch team, and we'll be back with Stacy Ike. Action News, celebrating 50 years with AccuWeather. If you think severe weather has been on the rise, you are correct. In the last three years, tornado warnings in our region have shattered records. With 52 last year alone, half of those warnings resulted in confirmed tornadoes, including two extremely rare EF3s. Thanks for always trusting us to keep you informed. 50 Years of AccuWeather is sponsored by Independence Blue Cross. Choose coverage you can count on with the region's strongest network. Welcome back to Philly Watch. So throughout our series, we're going to be featuring incredible women who make Philadelphia Philly. And to honor AAPI Month, we want to kick it off by celebrating Ellen Yin, who is here with us today and who we want to deem as our Woman of the Month. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, yes. Jasmine. Thank you, Ellen, for being here. I know that you've got a lot going on, so we appreciate you stepping in for these two minutes. So I'm going to jump right in. You are an amazing woman. You are a Penn graduate. You are the owner of High Street Hospitality. We know that one of your restaurants has been going for over 25 years, which is amazing. So you know Philly, you know food. So I'm gonna ask you a question. There's 30 seconds. But before you ask the question, I wanna give context. Okay. So earlier this year, we launched a campaign. I'm sure you know, come for Philadelphia, stay for Philly. Of course. And so it's all about inspiring travelers to look beyond what they know about Philadelphia and explore the unknown. So they may come for, you know, the Rocky statue, but they end up staying and browsing Renoir. They may come for the Bell in the Hall, but let's be real, everyone stays for the citywide special, which I'm sure you know. Yes. If you know, you know. (laughs) So anyone that's coming to Philadelphia, they might come for the cheesesteak, but they should stay for the... All the snacks. So Philly's dining scene has has grown up so much Mm -hmm. and there is something for everybody and my favorite thing to do is to walk around and in a city that I might not know try all different types of places where I can have like a little appetizer a little bite here and there but particularly since it is AAPI month I just want to celebrate two incredible neighborhoods Chinatown and South Philadelphia Chinatown is one of the best Chinatowns in the country it has a ton of diversity of different types of food from China and Mm -hmm. from um, from Korea as well as um, Vietnam and then um, South Philadelphia has an incredible Southeast Asian community and I just want to um, say that the Southeast Asian market on um, at FDR Park is one of the gems of Philadelphia. So if it were me, I would just be eating my way through Philadelphia. And um, you know, if you want a unique bite, these are some great places yeah. to go. And I would literally be right next to Ellen eating <laughs> yeah. our way through Philly. There couldn't have been yeah. a more perfect answer to that. <laughs> I know. I was just gonna say. And guess what? Philly is so walkable, so you could go from Chinatown exactly. to South Philly in one day and be able to explore those bites. Yes. Or do what I do, rent the Indigo bike. Oh, I love that's the Indigo smart. Bike. Yes. So, no. <laughs> uh, like Jasmine said, two minutes is not enough with you. Yeah. So 
If you want to learn more about Ellen and hear what she has to say, we actually did a podcast episode with her on Love and Grit, which you can find anywhere you stream podcasts. Yep. Season two, episode 23. Yes. So come back next week for more to do in Philly. Thank you so much, Ellen. Thank, Thank you. You stream on a Roku, a Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV. Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. Watch Action News Live. And the big story on Action News. Plus special programming, breaking news, and severe weather updates. Tremendous amounts of rain. Always on. Always the news team you trust. Watch 6ABC 24-7 on your streaming device. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the show. I'm joined this week by Stacey Ike. She is a TV and podcast host. Um, she's an entrepreneur and a producer. And um, I wanted, you know, um, your podcast, Human to Human, is so wonderful and, and deep, and it's enlightening for so many reasons, you know, in the stories that you share and the conversations. And there's a lot of talk in the world today about AI. And mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about that. I was, you know, wondering your thoughts about how we, because this is something that <laughs> keeps me up at night. Sure. You know, we need to stay human. And now we have this ability to do incredible things in science and technology with AI. What are your thoughts around it? Wow. Um. I'll be honest, I'm still cultivating them, if I'm honest, because it is something that I think when it first started getting really popular, I got a little nervous. I was like, wait, like I am not, how does somebody like me live in the world where like now we are kind of operating based on artificial intelligence? But at the same time, I recognize we've kind of always been doing that. It's just that now we're at different leaps and bounds of that because my iPhone used to not be an iPhone. I had a different phone. I was around when like, there wasn't a lot of cell phones or we had the newest one or the biggest ones. Like I was around for all of those stages. So I still think like, okay, it's constantly been changing and it's going to keep changing. And that's part of evolution. And I'm just doing my best not to be afraid of it and to use it wisely because there are a few AI tools that a friends of mine have been like, this would be so positive for you. And I've, I've taken on like, okay. Cause I mean, the beginning I was like, I don't want anything to be AI. Like everything needs to be natural. And it's like, well, I use Google, so it's not like I haven't already used some type of AI. It's just now it's a little more in our face, a little more pronounced. And so I'm just I'm, I'm educating myself at this moment and learning through the things that I think the tools that can be helpful and the things that I'm like, oh, I, I don't want to be resistant, but I just want to be particular and be like, OK, this this makes sense. This doesn't. And if it doesn't make sense, get more curious about it, you know, and because there's so much changing so fast that it's it's so hard to just shut it out. You're like, that's probably not the best. So I rather try to educate myself, try to learn, try to be open and then um, use that to make my next decisions on like just how it'll impact my life. Does it worry you at all about, you know, the speed with which everything is happening and changing? I'd be lying if I said it didn't. Yeah, it, it does that sometimes, mostly because I think about my parents and I'm like, how are they going to catch up? I feel like oh, I can yeah. catch up. Yeah. I'm like, I want people that are, I mean, if we're here on this planet, I want us to be able to use the best tools to like, you know, live full lives. But I do worry about like figuring out how to learn it in real time. I will say, I think being an entrepreneur gives me space to learn things because I'm constantly, I mean, I'm, I work digitally a lot. So I do have to inter intertwine with like these different softwares and resources and things like that. But if I wasn't, I think I would be even more like, wait, when do you have time to learn this stuff or even take it in? Right. So that is something I, I, I worry, but again, I'm trying to reframe that to, okay, it's happening and we're all here while it's happening. So everything is working out for us and let's figure out how we can like educate ourselves, learn, talk as a community and say, okay, this is actually more dangerous. Okay. This is cool. Let's, you know, how can we do this together and just be more open about the things that we want to bring in and the things we're like, okay, we'd rather not. Yeah. Are you a spiritual person? Where do you go when you have days where things feel heavy and hard? Yes, I am a spiritual person. I am so grateful for that um, because I don't know what else I'd be doing <laughs> if that wasn't a part of my, you know, my ethos, existence, um, all the things. We're all truly, we're spiritual beings having a human experience. It's just about tapping into that and Every day I'm learning more and more. I go to the books that educate me and that 
enlighten me and that open me up. I go to um, meditations and prayers that open me up and that keep me grounded. I am doing my best now to even like insert a meditation at night as well. Like before we go to bed, instead of just going to bed with all of the day, like allowing the day to wash away and 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 kind of have that moment with with yourself, with God, with reflection, whatever you call God, however that looks for you. Um, and just being, yeah, being able to release that. So I, I infuse spirituality in so much of my life and my work in my continuous journey because I want to get to know myself at the highest level while I'm here. And so I want to keep discovering and learning and yeah, just being open to what nature provides us, what, what the sky provides us, what the stars provide us, what each other provides us. Like all of that to me is intertwined in spirituality. Mm, that's beautiful. Yeah. Um, one of the greatest questions I ever heard was a question you ask all your guests. So I'm going to ask you because it's mm. such a good question. Um, what is the last thing you forgave yourself for for the first time? You would think I, <laughs> this is so, <laughs> wow. I should have been prepared for that. Um, yeah. Okay. The last thing I will say it's not for the first time, but the last thing I forgave myself for was yesterday, actually, when I was a little upset with myself on my uh, routine. So one thing I learned about routines is like, they're not, they're not meant to stay routines forever. They're meant to be the routine that reflects what you need in that moment and they can change. And so I had a moment with myself of like, you know, for the past six months, I've been going to bed at 8.30 PM and being up at 4.30. And I didn't even think I could ever do that. I was like, what? Like I have been trying to be that person. And one day I like just started doing it. And then months were going by and I was like, you're still doing this. This is amazing. And so for the past two weeks, um, I just, it just hasn't been as consistent. And I was yesterday, I, I met myself with some like upsetness of, Hey, like you can't get off track now. And then I realized like, no, you were doing that because you were in season and you needed that type of structure. And now you're out of season and you're allowed to take a break. So like, mm -hmm. forgive yourself for the fact that you are needing it to be like that. That's something I'm always constantly learning, learning to like hold and let go, you know, when to hold and let go, when to say, okay, this is actually something really important. You need to stay in the structure in this routine and actually let it go and start a new one and see and be open enough to figure out what it is. So I had to forgive myself for like, the rabbit hole I went down and I was like, come back up. Don't stay there long. That's crazy. So yeah. that was yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you ever feel that we can or are capable of reaching a level of enlightenment where we are consistently forgiving ourselves, um, not being a perfectionist, yeah. not, you know, practicing imposter syndrome, all the stuff that we know, yeah. All the books have been read, all the, right? Is it possible to ever reach that place and just live? It? Would I love, you know, the idea of living in the flow? Yeah. What a beautiful question. I feel like I'll let you know when I find out. Like, I don't know. <laughs> I will. I, because I'm still in it and very much living out what I'm learning. So sometimes I think that the people I learn from have already like the gurus in my life have already established that. And then one day they'll have a moment. I have mentors who come to me and talk about things that like they're working through and I, it'll just make me feel so like, wow, I didn't think you had any problems anymore. Right. And that's one of those moments of like right. it's exactly why we do what we do as right. human, what you're doing. Like we are all a reflection of each other. There's, as far as I can tell, there's no one who's made it. There's no one who was like, at the highest of everything because there's always someone better than you in some skill there's always someone with more money than you there's always someone with a different like we're here on on earth so while we're here we're in a game of learning and growing constantly and there's kind of no reason to stop that unless you're ready to go like to be honest so yeah right yeah so i guess my answer is probably no but I will still say maybe it's a merging of both of like, I'll let you know as I continue to learn. <laughs> yeah. And I would say right now in history, um, I shouldn't, I mean, there have always been philosophers and people who really spend a lot, you know, their mental labor is in, yeah. why are we here? What is the meaning of life? You know? Mm -hmm. um, and you reference yourself as a connoisseur of culture. Mm. So, you know, being out there and public and visible and having these conversations you know, what do you see as 
troublesome in culture? And what do you think is really a positive right now? You know, what, what mm -hmm. have we learned as a society that makes you feel good? Hopeful. That's so good. That's so good. Okay. So I'll say that one thing I love is that we are in a space of reimagining what self-love looks like without like, I do think that self-love is something that just isn't really taught. It's not like it. And, and between your shampoo bottles and your lipstick and all the things that tell you like, you need it, you need it, you need it. There's no real room for you to, to see yourself and love yourself as you are where you are as a constant practice. Like we don't really get that practice. And I do think that now there's a wave of that. I love having conversations with my parents about like things that they haven't really worked through or didn't have the capacity to work through while they were raising us. But now that they're like, oh, wow, like I, did, I love seeing the reflections that they're having because I think there's just the consciousness in the air of like, I'm allowed to reflect. I'm allowed to love myself. I'm allowed to like have a boundary. I'm allowed to change it up. I can change my mind. I think that is so positive and really important that we all do that because I do think we, there was a, just an air of perfectionism that we all like went through at some point and now it's being lifted. So I think that's really positive. What I will say that I'm not loving, but I, I know we'll like, it, you know, sometimes life can just go on two extremes. I want to make sure that while we're learning to love ourselves, we are not using that to shame other people. We're not using that as like to ways to judge other people. Right now, there's a lot of conversations on the internet of like, if people don't do this for me, cut them off. If people don't do that, cut them off. If they're not the type of person you, that you like or you love or they, they lie to you or whatever, it's like, that's not actually real life, guys. Like there's no way we can be in real relationships with people without grace, without mistakes, without learning. So we don't want to go on the other extreme of like, okay, if there's no perfectionism, there needs to now be, I'm just picking myself at all times because I just don't even think that's realistic either or fruitful. So that is something I'm always like paying attention to and trying to add my two cents where necessary um, of moments that I think that can be really important of how we how we like learn from each other and ask each other questions before we cut somebody off, get curious before you get upset, get curious before you judge, get curious. Like I, I want that to be a big staple of either how of like what my work can do as well as like what we do together as, as people. Yeah. Um, are you, so again, human to human is the podcast that you host now and it's super. And are you working on any other projects that you can share or did that you're dreaming about thinking? Oh, about wow. That's a great question. I've been so inundated with the show. I will not lie to you that we just wrapped four days ago. And so I'm like taking a two week break of Yay. about anything else. Take a break. Right. Yeah. So I'm taking a break. And the next time we chat, I'll have more updates for you. I'm definitely, I mean, we're, we're still running. So the human to human podcast still has new episodes coming out. So please check that out. They're fabulous. Um, but I personally am taking a, a two second break before walking into like whatever that next dream is. Yeah. Um, I want to share uh, this quote is, is on your site. It's out there. People know that, you know, this is something you believe in and it's so beautiful. Um, each moment I decide to be myself, I give someone else permission to do the same and that is so true um, when people just let everything go and they're not performing or thinking about the next thing they're going to say. Mm -hmm. It really does make the person in front of you relax. And, and when did you discover that? Wow. Um, I love that quote. And I didn't actually know when I... I said it somewhere around 2017 and my team at the time pulled it and was like, that's really great. We need to like, make sure that you recognize that as something you said. And it's so funny. Cause I don't even think I was, I definitely wasn't the version of myself now that I was then. Mm -hmm. And so I said it before becoming it, you know, and before like living it fully, I would say that I, at that time, yeah, that was who I was, but now I'm, I meet myself today and I'm like, Oh my God, this is who you are. And that also was like, in five years, I'll be somebody else. And I now enjoy that so much. I think at that time I was like, okay, everybody be yourself. But I didn't actually know how to like help anyone do it or exact, cause I was still figuring it out. And so it's, it's such a beautiful, it, as you said it, I'm like thinking, oh my God, like you said that five years ago and you weren't even you yet. And mm -hmm. now I feel like I have so much more to contribute around 
being yourself and being okay with how much time it takes to learn what being yourself even means. Yeah, Cause like it's so it time to learn that. Yeah. It does. Yeah. 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 And, and that's something, you know, it, does it always have to come with age? <laughs> you know, I, I have a daughter and I, and I'm always saying to her, Sarah, I don't want you to wait, you know, 50 years to believe in yourself. Yeah. I, I really yeah. want it to happen for you now, but you cannot make that happen for another person. As yeah. Much as you want. Go ahead. Well, yeah. I don't know if it's specifically age or if it's experience or if it's like, what's the um, openness or availability within, because, you know, at that time I said that, I think I was like 26, you know, I didn't, I really think now I'm like, you don't even know what you were, how did you know to say that? But you weren't even there yet really. And now I'm thinking, I'm like, Oh, you, feel so much more connected to that. You really feel the depths of that. And in five years, I'm going to say, oh, you really understand. You know, like that is the the funny thing about life. But I don't necessarily think it's age. I think it's like a decision to, you know, be open to that or the time that your guru, like, you know, your, your, your guru in your daughter's life too. And so the moment she might hear from you at this age and be like, oh, okay, I get you. And then she might hear from somebody at school and then be like, oh my God, I heard it. Or a teacher or somebody else and it'll click. So yes. I think like it's more of just when it clicks and that could be any time because yeah. I've seen things click for me that I'm like, I've actually said it's too early for me to learn this. There's things that I've learned. I'm like, this is too early. I don't want to know this. And I've had people in my life be like, life, life gifted it to you now. So you don't have to learn it in 20 years. And there are some. My guess is, my guess is you were in a conversation and it happened and you recognized it. Yes. Yes. You know, yes. because yeah. for you to even say it, you just must have experienced the power of being with someone and seeing them be themselves and recognize that it's because in that moment you were fully yourself. And yes. then maybe you know you yeah. you forget, but yes. Exactly. Like you just go through the journey. Sometimes you forget and then you, it calls you and then like later it clicks and you're yeah. like, this is, yeah. yeah. Do you have young women in your life that you mentor and you know, what kinds of things are you hearing from them about how hard it, I could never grow up today? <laughs> I, just, I mean, it, it's so hard. Yeah. Yeah. The nonsense uh, that's out there. You know what I mean? Yes, I do. I do. And I, I, I have moments of like, oh, am I like on the other side of this now where I'm like, I would never do that. I would never do that. And I'm, and I'm really grateful to be an older sibling in this, like, this is something that although it was a part of my journey of like, oh my God, what a responsibility. It's also such a gift because I have two younger sisters and two younger brothers. And so my younger sister and I, um, one of them particularly, she's 20, she's 20. And so obviously getting to know about her life and what it takes to be 20 and while she's learning what it takes to be 32. And so mm -hmm. it is very fascinating, the types of stories we exchange, the ways that she talks about her community, her friends, like what's interesting to them, what they care about. I go to her a lot about what is interesting to the Gen Z culture, because I want to stay close to them and understand them and, and also, you know, contribute where I can. I've had conversations with her and she'll be like, Stacey, you want, you're asking me to do something that's like above my age right now. And I'm thinking, oh, I thought I was just giving you advice so you didn't have to go through that. And it's like, I guess no one can take the going through away from anybody else. Like mm -hmm. I can, you know, be a mirror effect and show you something. And whenever it clicks for you, it'll click. And that has been such a fascinating um, lesson to learn because as an older sibling, I thought like, oh yeah, they're going to skip some of these phases because why wouldn't I want them to do that? And they might not. And I've had conversations about things that like her generation thinks about, worries about. They they definitely worry about their future in the same way my generation did, but what their future entails is so different. Like the types of jobs that they take, the way they have boundaries, the way they quit jobs if they like aren't seen being don't feel seen. I'm like, I never told the boss I don't feel seen. Like that never happened to me. <laughs> like that never happened. So, not, we were not doing that, you know. You know I'm like, generation. what? Yeah. So they have, there is also a level of just mental, mental care and mental health that they had that, that I don't think any generations had before them. And so it's very fascinating. And then also there's some things that they aren't very well versed in, in terms of like, you know, we were big in my, like in the, as a nineties baby, we were just big 
you know, overachievers. <laughs> like we were just overachievers. Like we were always doing something right. and they're not really like that. They're not like always going to be doing something. They're going to be doing what they want to do. So mm -hmm. trying to meet the skills of that and also nurture that and figure out how to say like, let's turn this, make sure it's productive. Um, yeah. But the things that I, I'm just grateful to stay close and I'm learning to mentor them in the best way I can because, or show up for, you know, people that are younger than me in the best way I can, because I have to recognize now these are experiences that I didn't have. So I can only contribute with like what I know, what I've learned and where I, and I have to be a, I have to be a listener. Part of mentoring is being a listener. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you think you are today where you're meant to be? <sighs> wow. I love that question. I, I do. I do. I, there are, of course, there are things in life that I wish were different, but I also feel very lucky, very lucky to have found a passion so early and to get to discover that passion over and over and over again. Like mm -hmm. podcasting wasn't around when I went to college. So, or it probably, it was around. I just wasn't into it at that time. But I'm thinking of like how much it's affected my life now. And I truly, I just, I get teary eyed a lot about it. Um, I'm reading a book right now and there was a, a paragraph uh, about, you know, finding your passion. And I just immediately started crying of like, I can't believe I'm living in mine. Like, I actually really love this. I, I, I'm in it. And that is a gift I don't take for granted. So yeah, in that, in that regard, I do feel like I am exactly where I'm supposed to be. Well, you just answered my last question was when was the last time you cried? So <laughs> oh my God. It was yeah, this was um Saturday. Saturday specifically because I was reading that chapter and I was like, I just got so emotional. I was like, oh my God, like this is not I just wow, I was the book is um Eight Rules of Love by Jay Shetty. And um I was just so inspired. He's awesome. Oh yeah. he's awesome. he's that's so what kind of grateful hits you really hard, right? Oh, Oh, gratitude. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, listen, I enjoyed this so much. I wish I had more time with you. We'll have you back when, yeah. when, we, when you announce your next project, whatever that might be. Yes. Right. Or you land Michelle Obama at, for an interview. Which you, <laughs> will. you will. Of course you will. Um, so thanks so much, Stacey. Of course. Get Thank your time. You. Thank you so much for the beautiful questions. I really appreciate the reflection, Sue. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Stay with us for our watch team and we'll be right back. Is the best vacation one that you find or one you get lost in? One that takes you to new heights or reminds you to go with the flow, to get your feet wet and your wheels spinning. One that lets you find your own rhythm or get carried away. Find the best of yourself. Get lost in the woods. Plan your stay in the wild woods today. From Philadelphia to the Lehigh Valley and everywhere in between, for 150 years, Penn Community Bank has been a part of your neighborhood. Helping businesses start, supporting families as they grow, and staying connected to the people and places that make this region special. It's who we are and where we're from. Penn Community Bank, here we are and here we grow. There's a moment, every hour, every day, every week. These moments shape our world. They add color, perspective, and sometimes pain. Moments are meant to be shared, shared by friends, family, people you trust. At Action News, we cherish every moment, and it's our profound responsibility to bring you closer to your world. Never miss a moment. Trust the people at Action News. 
Do you stream on a Roku, a Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. Watch Action News Live. And the big story on Action News. Plus special programming, breaking news, and severe weather updates. Tremendous amounts of rain. Always on. Always the news team you trust. Watch 6ABC 24-7 on your streaming device. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today everyone for another week of women to watch i hope you enjoyed my conversation with stacy it was so fun um next week i'll be taking the week off because my daughter's getting married um so you can find our next show uh the week after thank you as always to our corporate partners and our watch team members and kateri for producing the show have a great week, everyone. It's the number one news at 10 p.m. Action news on PHL 17. Join Shari Williams, Gray Hall, Deuces Rogers, and meteorologist Adam Joseph for all the big stories at a time that's right for you. Action news at 10 p.m. on PHL 17. Hi, this is Sue Rocco. Women to Watch is pleased to share a clip from Breaking Through, a podcast hosted by Madeline Bell, the president and CEO of Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. This interview is part of a series in which Madeline interviews CHOP's women scientists about what inspires them and advice they have for other women interested in pursuing science and medicine careers. My guest today is Dr. Holly Hedrick. Dr. Hedrick is a pediatric and fetal surgeon at CHOP. She is also co-director of a frontier program that focuses on a rare condition called congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Dr. Hedrick, welcome to Breaking Through. Thank you. What inspired you to pursue a career in surgery? I think it probably started with my father. He was a dentist in a small town, and I was his assistant, you know, putting on the little bib. So I think the first inspiration was definitely my father. Can you tell us what is congenital diaphragmatic hernia? Congenital diaphragmatic hernia is a birth defect that happens very early, around the 11th week of gestation. And the diaphragm, which is really the separation between the chest and the abdomen, it has a defect in it. And this defect allows things that are supposed to be in the abdomen, like the liver, the spleen, the stomach, the intestines, it allows them to move up into the chest. About 85 to 90% of the patients we see with CDH are diagnosed before they are born. And we can plan for it, and they are right here at the time. Why did you decide to specialize in this condition? Ah. Early on, this was way back in residency. It was considered an unsolved problem, and so I was involved in preclinical studies and really developed a desire. And so that whole spectrum of the disease and that whole life course was really attractive to me. To hear more of Madeline's interviews with CHOP's amazing doctors and scientists, listen to Breaking Through with Madeline Bell, available wherever you get your podcasts. We are CHOP, and we can't wait to show you around. We are the nation's first children's hospital. Now, a care network with more than 50 locations that continues to expand. Three state-of-the-art research buildings with 1.5 million square feet of space. We have grown from 12 beds 165 years ago to nearly 600 beds and one of the best children's hospitals in the world. We have a level one trauma center, 11 floors of patient units, more than 20 operating rooms, first of its kind delivery unit for babies with birth defects, a separate cardiac operative and catheterization suite, and places to learn, like our internationally recognized simulation center, we have trained generations of leaders in the field of pediatrics. We are world leaders in medicine, surgery, and science. One of the top recipients in NIH funding for pediatric research. In this building, pioneers in CAR-T therapy, mitochondrial disease, brain tumors, hyperinsulinism, and other rare diseases. Here, groundbreaking work in fetal surgery, genetics and genomics, and neurology. In our newest building, leaders in social determinants of health, clinical informatics and epidemiology, autism, trauma and injury prevention, 
our patients come from every state and 115 countries. Meeting these challenges requires the best and the brightest. We are passionate about pediatrics. We are motivated to make a difference in the world and in our community. We are a team. We are CHOP. Do you stream on a Roku, a Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. Watch Action News Live. And the big story on Action News. Plus special programming, breaking news, and severe weather updates. Tremendous amounts of rain. Always on. Always the news team you trust. Watch 6ABC 24-7 on your streaming device. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. Put you at the top. One, two, three. Whoa. Now, the Women to Watch, Military Watch. Hi, I'm Sean Casey, Senior Director of Military and Veteran Affairs at Comcast NBC Universal. The Navy Reserve recently celebrated its 108th birthday. Formed in 1915 at the outbreak of World War I, the Navy Reserve continues to proudly live up to its motto of honor, courage, and commitment. These words, these values for each sailor to live up to also have a special link to Women's History Month and advancing equality within the military. In 1942, the Women Accepted for Volunteer Emergency Service, or WAVES, became a division of the U.S. Navy Reserve. This force opened opportunities for women to serve in several fields, including aviation, medical professions, communications, intelligence, and science and technology. However, WAVES remained closed to black women. And it wasn't until 1944 and after the urging from civic, religious, and civil rights organizations that the U.S. Navy permitted black women to join WAVES. Soon after, Harriet Ida Pickens and Frances Wills graduated from the Navy Reserve Midshipman School and became the U.S. Navy's first black female officers. Pickens was the daughter of William Pickens, one of the founders of the NAACP, who encouraged her to join the organization. She would go on to lead physical fitness training at Hunter Naval Training Station. Wills, a social worker, didn't have a brother to serve in the military, so she felt it was her duty to represent her family in the war effort. Wills would go on to teach naval history to incoming recruits and then return to her social work counseling veterans struggling with the horrors of war. These women exemplified the epitome of honor, courage, and commitment. Their willingness to dive into so many unknowns for the greater purpose of service to others is incredibly inspiring. Thank you, Ida. Thank you, Harriet. And happy birthday, Navy Reserve. <laughs>